This is iFanboy Pick of the Week, number 921, brought to you by iFanboy listeners like you. Hey, it's Josh Flanagan. I am here with, my God, it's really him, Connor Kilpatrick. (laughs) I I don't even remember how to do this anymore. I gotta say, I'm a little disappointed in you. (laughs) I could have just kept this good thing going. I'm just, you know, I'm out here, I'm juggling, I don't know what you're doing. I imagine there's a good portion of the listening audience who's also disappointed. Well, I think I think too much of me is not a good thing. I'm old enough now to recognize that. <laughs> it just so happens this is just a really busy time of the year. And sometimes life happens. I have feelings too. I know. Trust me. Most of these things I don't want to be going to. Okay. You know? How does that change it for me? It doesn't really. It really That's is all right. about you. Exactly. Oh, man. It used to be. I remember those oblivious days. I thought it was about me. Turns <laughs> out not. If you're out there and you think it's about you, it isn't. Just so you know. This is my fanboy pick of the week, number 921. Every week, one of us picks the book of the week, picks a book they like the best from their stack of comics that week, and they call it the pick of the week. I just changed the name of the, the, <laughs> the show. Actual, yeah. Like our 921 episodes in, 20 plus years, Josh unilaterally changes the show name. Yeah, whatever. We'll talk about that comic book and other books from the week. Uh, there is a patron pick, which is a book that the patrons pick. Really pretty well named, if I'm going to be honest. There should be listener mail, uh, if that's possible. It's a good time. I'm very happy to have Connor back, and I'm going to be mostly done with passive-aggressive shaming. Mostly. Because you're shaming me, I will say, and I'll, I don't like to name drop, but two weeks ago, at the time you were recording the show, assuming you were recording at the normal time, I was at a tiki bar in Palm Springs with Marsha Cook. That's what I was doing. Well, somebody's, to, I mean, listen to you. You're, you're trying to tell me you're busy, some things you don't want to do, and then you, <laughs> I wanted to do that. Like, that was fun. I'm out of the tiki. Come and my on, grandma now. and our wives. There we go. There are spoilers for comic books, so you know that. Connor, yeah, you had the pick. I did. Yeah. It was awesome. Should have it next week, too. Just tell me what it is. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll send you the email. I, you know, this was a big week. There was a lot of good big releases. A lot of our favorite books were out this week. Some, some returning favorites. And, you know, a big new miniseries, uh, the sequel sort of to the, one of the ones we loved a hell of a lot a couple of years ago or last year or whenever the hell it was. But I finished reading my books and again, I kept coming back to The Amazing Spider-Man 940 or 46. And you and I are famously the only people in the world who like this comic, but this was awesome. Zeb Wells, terrific art by Carmen Carnero, a name I'm not super familiar with. I saw the cover and I was like, oh, Ramita's, he's, you know, he's not what, not what he used to be. By the way, totally fair. And then I opened up, I was like, this looks great. Carmen Carnero's awesome. I don't know where he, where he has been before, if I've seen him or not. But man, I loved that, the way this book looked. And, you know, it also plays into a lot of the things we loved. So this, we're, you know, we're now post the big gang war story, which I liked. Didn't love it, but I liked it. And now we're back in the world. And I was a little conflicted about this book, and we'll get to that in a moment, but you know, the basic conceit is that the Sinister Six are feeling that they're missing a, an appendage because one of their six is in prison. Mysterio's there, Vulture's there, Craven's there, Dr. Octopus is there, our favorite Electro's there, but Sandman is in prison and, and they decide they're going to break him out because they just aren't the same at five. They need the six. This just felt like a classic Spider-Man story. I love the original villains. This is all the best ones. Yeah. And it was a full lean into what we all know about the Electro costume. The way that it was revealed. It was a big part of it. I'm not going to lie. I mean, right. wasn't he wearing another dumb suit for a while? That Probably. wasn't this one. I feel like this might have been a triumphant return to his original costume. But that first shot of him sitting at the table, and I put it up on our Instagram with his feet up. And it's a terrific drawing. The feet are in the foreground. He's got his hands behind his head. He's the asshole at the work meeting. But you know what? Like I said on the Instagram, when you look that good, you can be as big of an asshole as you want. First of all, that first page, we don't know what's going on at the beginning. We just like, by the time you get to the end of it, you sort of figured out who they are and what they're talking about. And it's the Sinister Six. And so it's six panels and they're all wearing their classic costumes, by the way. Except for Doc Ock, but close enough. Doc is pretty close. He's got the bowl cut. He's green and like that. You know, I'll take that. It's close. So there's empty seat, which is the fifth panel. And the sixth panel is the sound effect shows that it's the moment the feet hit the desk or the table. They're yellow. So you know what it is. So, So like that panel leads into the page turn. Yeah, it's terrific. In a fun little way. Do you always have the racing stripes on his legs? I'm not complaining if he did. I think he has. And Carmen Carnero's work makes it look very sort of real and lived in, which is terrific. And then we have like Peter Parker's dating woes, the, the woman he went on a one accidental date with before he runs into her. She's all mad at him because he fucked it up. And 
Mary Jane happens to see it because Wait, she's hanging though, around. There's a thing. There's a mystery there. Somebody called her and set it up, and it wasn't him. That's interesting. I did note that. So something's going on. She is whose lawyer is she? She's Tombstone's, Tombstone's. lawyer. Yeah. Mary Jane happens to see it because she's hanging around his jackpot. Put a fucking giant pin in that for a second. Yeah. And then you have uh, Mary Jane's aunt sort of filling the Aunt May role where she's in prison and she's sort of become the den mother to all the supervillains in, in is it is it Blackhaven? What is it? Blackgate? Uh, no. Uh, uh, you talk, I'll find it because it's uh, in here. It's not the raft. It's the other one. Raven? Right. Ravenclaw? No, that's Harry Potter. <laughs> it's the Hufflepuff prison, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Those Ravenclaws, man. They have their own prison. Ravencroft. Ravencroft. And so then there's a, it happens to be the prison where Sandman is, and they, they are on plant therapy together, Mary Jane's aunt and Sandman, and they're really enjoying it. And then there's, of course, the prison break happens, and the Sinister Six show up, or the Sinister Five show up to break out Sandman, he's conflicted. And, and then, of course, at the end, he, just, he chooses to join them again. And when I finished it, it felt like a, even though this isn't like a self-contained story, it's continuing on, it felt like this awesome, self-contained Spider-Man short story. There were little funny bits with the guards. That was great. I was just going to mention that, just one panel on a page. That was just a fun little conversation. Is he the coolest guy you ever transported? Well, like, I did Cletus Cassidy once. No way. Like, it was just like a little not. fun bit. Yeah. Everything in here worked really well, including at first the villains are going to escape and the aunt is like, no, you guys, you guys shouldn't do it. It'll mess up your sentencing. And they're like, we're the bad guys. We have to. But they're also not bad enough. They don't care for her and protect her. Right. Which I thought was really terrific. Yeah, that was really heartwarming. This whole thing was great, except for. Okay. Oh, and then it ends with, you know. Peter and Mary Jane have a little bit of a moment of like, should they get back together? Or should they talk about it? And they decide not to for now. We're going to talk about it. And that is worth discussing. But I think before you get into the other issue, I just think that this as a whole issue worked really well because you came in late and you got out early and there's yep. a bunch of mysteries dropped. And those mysteries have very little to do with what has happened before. We've moved along from that last story about the gang war. And we're, we're sort of setting all the seeds for other things. You know, it is one of those issues. This is, you know, I say this a lot, but it, it reminds me of like you pick up a random issue and you kind of want to know what happened before. And then by the end, you want to know what happens next. Before the show started, Josh and I were actually talking about comic book storytelling and how much it's changed and why. And because apparently we do our own show before the show. It's a pre-show that was just the two of we us. We can't help it. You're, you just pull the little zip thing and the wheels start going. <laughs> and this is a really good example of the sort of the best you can do probably with the modern constraints in telling an old school sort of marvel style story it's a mm -hmm. soap opera there's lots of threads that weave in and out of prominence as you go even if you're trapped within the six issue arc constraints that they are in now uh -oh. it still feels very much like this could have been a book from 1987 did you see the cover of the next book the uh -huh. next issue? it's not good it's stupid ben riley and his oh no all hallows or whatever she's called well we'll always have 940 well this is yes we will always have 940 <laughs> <laughs> There's the mystery in this about, like, what's the deal with Sandman? Like, he's right. now, I didn't know that there was a, a different guy in him. I didn't know Flint Marco wasn't who he was. Right. And so. Oh, God, and it then, is Ben Riley. Oh, damn it. Yeah. And, and his, his lady friend. That is one of the worst villain turns. Like, just like, yeah. all right, from out of nowhere. Then maybe this is kind of a one shot because it says not the end at the end, which means it's not going directly into the next bit. It's just that the Sinister Six is now reconvened and they will pop up later. Yeah, and there's some Sandman thing going on. So to get right into it, so the the lady shows up, and she's been watching him, and I thought, oh, that must be his sister, the clone. <laughs> I was pretty far into the second page of that. Oh, you mean the, the lady or Mary Jane? Mary Jane, I mean. Same. 100%. Okay. Yes. Those goggles are terrible. Those, stop putting goggles on people. It looks dumb. <sighs> I hate... Mary Jane being a superhero. I hate it. And this week we also had a Black Cat book, Jackpot and Black Cat, which is them teaming up together. It's the first Black Cat book I have not bought. It's your man, Jed McKay. He did this. I understand. Mm -hmm. But not every character needs to be a superhero to have worth. I don't want her to be a superhero any more than I want Perry White to be a superhero, any more than I want Jarvis to be a superhero. Supporting characters in a book that they are supporting, it's okay if they're just supporting. It doesn't make them any less than makes them just as important this is a big problem i had in the cw shows by the end of all of those shows they basically ran out of ideas and gave everyone superpowers on the flash it was comical like every single character that showed ended up being a superhero by the end of it it's just like mary jane shouldn't be a superhero she just shouldn't she's got plenty of worth on her own she's held up her own stories on her own just being herself mm -hmm. there was that terrific miniseries a couple of years ago where she was in hollywood 
And she was able to be a hero on her own without having this dumb roulette wheel power. Or not roulette wheel. Uh, uh, I don't even know where this came from. Like, I don't remember it happening. What's the thing in Vegas? This is how much of a gambler I am. Jackpot? Pull the arm. Oh, slot machine. Slot machine power. That's what she has. I just hate it. I hate it. I, so I'm thinking about this a lot. There's a lot of things that we hate. And many of them have to do with changes to long-standing characters. And when it happens, I think often because it doesn't feel organic, like, but the characters should change or have the illusion of change. change. And then it all sort of goes back to what it is. But, you know, them having a team, uh, like, I don't like that they're not together, but I'm not supposed to. This is a kill your babies kind of thing. Right. And, like, the reason that she's not with him is because she skipped a bunch of time and ended up having a different family relationship. When she got back, she wasn't in the point. And, And part of me went, I'll just be back with him. It's you know, but like I was like, all right, no, that's that's like it's a valid thing. But I don't know, like having her be, I don't know, it doesn't feel organic. It doesn't make sense to me that I always feel kind of like she was also not, she wasn't a superhero because she knew what it was like. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So, but then you got this, and then I think I put Thunderbolts on here. But like, there's something in like there's, there's like a long time character, and part of me's like, there's nothing wrong with that character, so you don't need to do this thing. And I think that's part of what it is. It'd be like giving Aunt May powers. Like, I don't want Aunt May to have powers either. It'd be fun for one issue, like right. do for one issue. Yeah. But this has been going on for a long time with Mary Jane. It's just mm-hmm. dumb. I don't like it. I mean, it'll go away. It's just dumb. I'm sorry. But the issue was terrific. Even putting that aside, sure. I thought the issue was terrific. Her power is the same as, what's the phone booth one? From Dial DC? H for Hero. Dial H for Hero and yeah. um, Nico from The Runaways. Same same right. thing. It's just a writer's device. Any random power. Yeah. And they always yeah. end up having to break rules when they do that because sure. that's, you know, it like it's, it's kind of a, like if you're a writer, you're really giving yourself a challenge because you have to think of a new thing for them every time something happens. Right. But it also allows you to be like, oh, no, this power is totally inappropriate. Right. Or, you know. She had like what tentacles in this one? Yeah, I, I did like the device of him trying to save her and her being like, yeah, you, I, "I had it. You didn't need to do that." I was like, "Well, that's kind of nice. That's what." Okay, it was well. Like given the choice, it was done well. Let's travel through the multiverse membrane to Ultimate Spider-Man number three. Hickman, Chichetto, oh, Kaketo. Oh yeah, it was the Kiketto. first opportunity I had to say it right. I did it wrong. Kaketo. No, you caught yourself quick. Matthew Wilson, Corey Pettit. I really enjoyed this. I'm not surprised. Hickman's great and. Kiketto's great. It's just I'm still kind of waiting for the thing, meaning like what makes middle-aged Spider-Man interesting. So far, he just reads like he's regular Spider-Man. Yeah, basically. Other than having two children, you know? Like he doesn't read like he's middle-aged Spider-Man. So I'm waiting for that to be a thing. And also, it's just like there's not, I don't know, there's not like a learning curve or anything. Right, he's just pretty good at it already. There's a bit where like he stayed somewhere. He stakes somebody out for like a really long time. Yeah. It's like they'd know you were gone. Right. Like, if you have two little kids, there's a schedule. You can't just not show up. And I don't think he has a job. Does he? Is he the newspaper? I guess he works for the Daily Bugle in this. He's the Bugle, yeah. Well, still. That, I gotta say, I guess it makes good drama, and I can't complain about it, but like the thing where he's has a secret with his daughter, who's mm-hmm. very young, and not the other people in his family, I'm just like, oh, God, that's a car crash waiting to happen. Like, it really bothers me in a sort of parenthood way. And I get why it's fun and there's a fantasy to it and as well there should be. I think that what the book has done is it has differentiated itself, which was the thing we didn't see in the first issue, differentiated itself from the regular Spider-Man book and the original Ultimate Spider-Man book. But I think the problem is, is, you know, just what you said is just like, okay, he's old. I don't know. Like, I just don't if you're going like to do that, then do it. Like, make it a point in the character. It's just right now he doesn't feel any different, really, than 25 year old Spider Man. Right. And so, what's the he's point? He's like 35 year old Spider Man, and now right. I know, like, oh, 35 is also a child. <laughs> That's what we said about issue one. Was I don't see right now the reason for this mm-hmm. because it's the same. It's basically the same thing. I'm still waiting. For, I'm not disliking. It. I think it's a very good book. But I'm waiting for the reason for it to be different. I don't think it's bad. I have no complaints about it other than I'm not really very invested. And then the other thing is I'm just, I'm waiting for it to go off the rails. Mm. That's what I do with every Hickman book is I'm like, this is great. And eventually I'm going to get lost and we'll just have to deal with it. It's also interesting and I'm kind of wondering if it's ever going to be dealt with is that you know, the whole conceit is that in this world, there were no heroes because the bad guys who are secretly running it have, you know, engineered it so... They're making you wait for that. There's no breadcrumbs or anything. But they're just showing up now. So it's like, as anyone, like, why? Right. You know, why is this happening? Is, I this guess, would be a big deal. Question. Yeah. I mean, I'm guessing it's all part of the plan. 
And didn't I'm, Tony give Peter the suit? Why is Harry Osborn able to control it? You know, I mean, these are all things that they will deal with. But I'm, mm-hmm. you know, these are the things I'm asking myself as I'm reading it. Yeah, I just I don't find it that compelling. I'm I'm sitting I'm around sad. to see what the point is. And and again, you know, I, I've you know, Hickman is extremely intelligent, and he's an extremely good writer, and he plans really well. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, he's just not for me. Totally. Not like I can't stand this not for me, but I just don't I don't get out of it what we'll talk about it a little more later too. And I don't want to beat a dead horse. I don't have complaints about it. There's interesting stuff, but a little part of me, I don't want really three issues in. I'm just like, get on with it. We spent three issues watching I almost said Perry, but Jay Jonah and 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 Uncle Ben, ben like setting up their office. And I'm like, get to it. Well, I mean, to be fair, that's how the original Tone book was, you know. Sure. Things were really, really spread out. Yeah, but I think that there was some hook. I don't know, just a slow roll, but since everything is so familiar, it's not hooky. Well, the hook was that it was so different. This is, it seems such the same. It's just bizarre. Yeah. It's not bad. Duke number four is the penultimate issue of Duke. It's not enough issues of Duke. It's no. right there. It's not even close. But leave you want more. We guessed correctly last time we talked about it. They're doing a series of character-based minis. So Scarlet is coming next. And then what was the other one? Oh, Destro. I would love to stay in this world with these characters. I mean, I love the way Tom Riley draws everything. I love the sort of unfolding of this pre-G.I. Joe, pre-Cobra world. I keep remembering that it's Energon. Like, at one point, they break out of the jail, and I'm like, what the fuck is he? I forgot what he was so driven about, why everyone's against him. (laughs) Right. And I was like, oh, right, Transformers. And that's the big feint at the end, right? He thinks he's found evidence of Transformers, and they should have made you think that, but it's revealed to be a bat instead. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because literally last night I read the introduction of the bats in the original books. I saw the claw and the silhouette and I was like, that's a bat. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't, wasn't, you didn't fool me, buddy. Well, it wasn't that. It was the symbol shape. Mm-hmm. It was the chest instead of the face of the Transformer. That was what it Right. I yelped when they went to the basement of the pit and there was all the vehicles were down there. Mm-hmm. And then when they come busting out in, in a tank, like an ATV <laughs> and then a jet, I was like, could they even do that? It didn't matter. Well, this was the thing. I was like, Are they all fueled up? Sky Striker can't do that. And then I was like, they did that on the cartoon. I just watched a cartoon <laughs> where the Sky Striker landed on a beach and stopped just short of shipwreck in a hammock. Nice. I didn't get mad about that. So I can't get mad about this. But the thing that I thought was interesting is that they weren't flying the Sky Striker. He was just driving it around. <laughs> and I was like, all right, fair play. Someone's keeping all those vehicles fueled. That's dangerous. I liked Major Blood a lot. He's got the giant ugly scar now from being mm-hmm. shot in the face, so he's got to put his eye patch on. There's a little bit of a tension with Baroness. Like I thought this was just all really terrific, and I'm hoping it's still going to be awesome going forward. I loved the brief glimpses of sort of sexy Destro with the red suit and the open yes. shirt with the necklace. <laughs> who was the guy with him with the red shirt on page 13? He's somebody. I just couldn't remember who that is. Let's go to one of those big dudes scrap from iron? later. No, Scrap Iron. Scrap Iron no. showed up. He's Scrap Iron's messed up too. Oh, that guy. Ooh. Right. He's from later. Yeah. He's from later in, in the world. He's like a Cyclops. Or not Cyclops. Colossus, Colossus. kind of guy. Yeah. yeah. Knockout. Loving over. it. And I don't know what Tom Riley was doing previous to, to this, but man, he's terrific. Hmm. He's really good. And someone said, you know, this is Duke with a personality. And it's true. He does have a personality, but it, it isn't like from out of nowhere. No, no, no. Just the original Duke is just kind of boring. Right. But what I'm saying is what they designed for this didn't make me go, oh, that's from I don't know. Like it it, hmm. it still fits with it. Like he's a soldier who is trying to do what's right. And he's driven to do that because he knows it's the right thing. And, you know, it's just like any superhero. What's interesting also is, is again, I'm like, sorry to keep bringing it up, but rereading the original books, I'm up to issue 46, I think. Duke is hardly in it. He is barely in it at all up to this point in the story. They introduced him to take over for Hawk as the field commander. He was in a couple issues, and then he sort of pops up, like, well, looking at the screens. But he's, you know, at the time the cartoon's going, he's the main dude. He's barely in the comic. There's some story for that somewhere, like a behind the scenes story. Like they were like, we don't like Hawk, so you need a different person. And then you know, whoever it was running the show was like, use Duke. And there's a story that's interesting there somewhere. I would love to know it. Maybe somebody listening knows. Hawk just got promoted to Brigadier General, officially running G.I. Joe in the issue. Does he have right. his cool outfit yet, or is he still in his dumb outfit? No, no, he's still just wearing regular fatigues. Okay. Let's talk about the goon, Them That Don't Stay Dead, number one. Them That Don't Stay Dead, number one, by Eric Powell. So when we, I don't know, it's probably 20 years ago now, or maybe yeah. 
Yeah, like the goon came on the scene and it was like a big deal. It was one of those comics, comic people that, that like people who like pros loved it. And I, I got to say, like back then, like many things, I didn't get it. I didn't know what the point was. It was old timey. Mm. That was kind of the deal. And right. I don't think that I knew well enough to appreciate sort of the craft that had gone into it. Mm hmm. But uh, I think I've read it once or twice since then. But uh, there's been a lot of goon. There's an ad in the back of this that yep. sort of showed all the volumes. There's like five or six volumes of stories that were collected. And I, I kind of surprised it was that much. And I don't know what Eric Powell's been doing since then. He does books every once in a while for Dark Horse, just random things here and there. Yeah, he did it like an arc of action comics a while back. But it is one of those things like, I'm trying to think, like Hellboy in that like you just can start a story with the goon. He's just there. Isagi Yojimbo is the same way. It's this world that you're in. And what I appreciated now that I don't think, uh, again, that I wasn't really able to appreciate before is I was like, this is masterful comic book drawing. It yep. is. Eric Powell is such a good comic book artist. And he's not necessarily a great comic book artist for Marvel. Like I wouldn't right. want to be like, oh man, I can't wait to see him on Superman. Uh -huh. But what he's doing here in the same way that like Dave Stevens was the perfect artist for the Rocketeer or, you know, again, uh, Stan Sakai is the perfect artist for Yusagi Ojimbo. I'm just reading this and I'm looking at it and and like I'm trying to think of an artist to compare it to. There's like a, like a Matt Wagner kind of thing, like just sort of that classic look that has just enough lines and not too many. And it's this character who kind of looks ridiculous, but works for me and it is kind of adult and it was i basically i enjoy the hell out of this is what i'm getting at he would do a hell of a bibbo miniseries yes but again that's just like what's the point it's already looks like that like he's <laughs> he's just he should just do more goon i remember my first exposure to the goon was whenever that first time we went to WonderCon and we went to isotope the great comic store there that i was just there last week and James Sign, the proprietor, loaded us up each with a stack of trades. Do you remember that? We, we left each mm -hmm. of us at like 15 trades. And one of the ones I had was like volume two of Goon. And mm -hmm. he was like, you don't need to worry about it. You can just read whatever volume. Yeah. That was my first exposure to the Goon. Did you like it then? I think I liked it, but I didn't like read a ton. Right. You know, it's... I've not certainly read all of the Goon, but I've read it here and there. I, I enjoyed it. I'm not necessarily enough to read all of it. Look at the cartooning, like in the bar of all the faces. There's like a Mad Magazine yeah. quality to it, but yes, with there is. excellent storytelling and scenery. There's a page. So there's a so he Boone meets a girl. He says, "This seat taken." Mm -hmm. She's a tough lady with a one of the driver caps on, and they're in a rough bar. And mm -hmm. you know, she's like, "Don't hit on me," you know. And he's like, "Your seat's open. I just want to sit here." And then they sort of act tough to each other. And there's three panels at the bottom and you see you know he's just drinking his beer and she's considering something and then she goes can i buy you a drink and the face that he put on every every face that you can see in these panels is spectacular just right. wonderful draftsmanship and of sort of posture and expression you know and he doesn't even have his eyes to you don't he can't even do the eyes on the goon he's got to do the rest of it without it the villain is a little kid with a duck <sighs> That's all I know. Maybe he's shown up in other stuff, but it works. He looks like in Up when the guy was a little kid with a little pilot hat on. Like mm. that's what. It, but he's got a dead duck that he carries around. That's the villain. You know, I didn't know how to appreciate this stuff when I was younger. And now that I'm reading it, I really do, but I can't explain why. Well, it also feels very classic. Mm -hmm. It's a timeless world. Everyone's just sort of dressed like it's the 30s. That lives in the heart of comics, right? It's very Eisner-esque. Yes, yes, it is. But sometimes when people do that, it feels like they're doing a, an impression. Mm. you know of an earlier time and certain artists can get away with doing it and having it feel like it is part of that but it is its own thing and it is contemporary also right. and that's what i think is good here there's some beautiful work i posted another panel from this on our instagram of the mm. big fight scene the early going and him and his buddy frankie who likes to poop on everything including yeah. the bad guys in the background <laughs> they're having a big old brawl and look how good that it's on page uh what numbers is five in your digital reader and, and i love how oh, yeah. The foreground's all inked and sharp lines, and but then the background is all sort of sketchy in pencils and with no inks. And there's zombies. There's a clan member. There's right. a, like a redneck. It's just oh, it's so delightful. You're right, and that sort of like contrast between the sort of sharpened up inked characters in the front and then the others is just a. It's that looks like real pencil to me. Yeah, who knows? It's hard to say. Definitely could be digital. Fine. Like if I had to say anything, I was like, what is it that really stands out about you about this book and what do you love about it? And I was like, every time there's a foot, I love it. 
the shape of all the boots and feet that are drawn in this have that squared off thing that really only happens in cartoons. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool. <laughs> but it's it's a very much a lived in yeah. world that he has created here that is timeless. It has monsters that are kind of normal to be there. But it's not a horror mm. world. It's just sort of, sort of like fantasy 30s. There's hobos and there's riding the rails and everyone's got flat caps on. <laughs> there's no technology. So it's basically in that time period, but it, with goblins and vampires. And <laughs> it works in that way. Even like, you know, somebody gets killed at the end of this issue and I felt bad. Mm hmm yeah about it yes, even though we absolutely. just met them it's very well done he's a really good cartoonist and we, we we reserve that word for people like him or like jeff smith i didn't realize that the woman is the one at the beginning i thought she was just somebody that he sat next to at the bar i don't put that together i guess i hadn't really been paying attention soon enough no no she was the one running away from them yeah yeah, yeah. by the way first page second panel it's a billboard for <laughs> dutchy dies fine premium opium and the sentence says, now that's smooth. It's for the discerning gentleman. Oh. He's got an opium pipe. It looks like, you know, William Holden with an opium pipe. I think just in the past, like, I would read through this and I would be like, yeah, I see the skill there. It's not really, but I was riveted when I read this. Like, I was like, I got to go back and read more of this. I was having so much fun. But this would probably have been my pick of the week just in terms of, like, something I wasn't expecting and I mm -hmm. just really enjoyed. Yeah, it was very good. Let's take a quick break and talk about how you... The listener can support us. That's how the modern economy works. The modern podcasting media economy, it's all user supported. I mean, hardly anyone is not a listener supported show at this point, even the big ones. And how can you do that? How can you say, hey, I enjoy what the guys do. They do at least six shows a month and they got jobs and families. And how do you do that? We do patreon.com slash I found what's the main way. If you support us that way, you get to unlock shows for everyone. That's why we do the media explode. That's why we do the book explode, the talk explode. You can become part of a great community on Discord and Facebook. There's a monthly patron hangout we enjoy doing quite a bit. We try to make it fun for everybody. They get their own merchandise. And if you want to join up and you want to say, hey, can I just pay you once a year? Yes, you can. And you get 10% off if you do that. $5 or higher level, you get access to this show without the ads. Not this one, but the other ones. All kinds of fun stuff. We hope to make it fun for you. But mostly we hope you think that this show is worth the support. And we thank you, all of you who've done that, because honestly, we say it all the time, but it's true. The show couldn't go on without you. We couldn't pay them bills, which is not inconsiderable. Fanboy.threadless.com is our t-shirt store. Well, it's all kinds of merchandise, but mainly t-shirts. We just had a big spring sale. A bunch of people bought new shirts. It was fun to see. If one is Electro, it's one of our favorite designs. It's on there. It makes sense. It's the most inside shirt you'll ever wear to anything. Nope. Eat at. We had a joke about a new shirt recently, but I don't think it was actually we were serious. We'll, we'll eventually we'll get a new shirt in there. I There's don't 13 remember. designs. You can go through all of them. I found out.com slash support is our PayPal digital tip jar. If you just won that $1.1 billion lottery in New Jersey, if you're one of our New Jersey listeners, you know what to do. Tithe. 10%. <laughs> Are we a religious institution? We could be. File the right paperwork. <laughs> I'll wear a robe. I'm just saying 10%. You're not even going to notice that. It's true. In your new crazy life. Before you overdose on cocaine. Yeah. By the way, it doesn't end up well for most lottery winners from what I understand. So let's just ease it up for you a little bit. So right. We'll help you out. Good. That's a lot less cocaine to buy. And it'll ultimately be better for you. <laughs> I found out to come slash support. Oh, I just did that one. I found out to come slash Amazon. In your mind, all people who become rich develop cocaine habits. I assume. <laughs> so that's what rich people do. I, 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 a lot of them do. I know that. That's true. I met them. I found out to come slash Amazon. You can shop there. It's a general shopping link. We thank everyone who does that. You can also, if you can at this moment, eventually you'll find the links to all the Booksload books. They changed the code and it blew up the page, but we're working on fixing it in our generous spare time. And uh, eventually that'll be there. But you can find those links. Um, you can find the links to the music of the show. You can find the links to the, the picks of the weeks in the, in the show posts. We get a little piece of that action. It doesn't come out of your pocket. We thank everyone who does that. And finally, bookshop.org. We post links to the books that we talk about in the books below in those posts. If you want to help local bookstores, they fulfill orders that you order from bookshop.org. And it helps them keep them alive. And we thank everyone who does those things to keep the show going because this is all a big community collective. Everyone's got a part to play. I was going to get real communist on you, but I decided not to. That's fine. It's so gauche right now. So I feel like you're about to say something negative about God's number six. But I really liked it. And I don't know why. I, let me caveat there saying... There you go. I don't think I should at this point, but I really liked this particular issue because it felt very much like a classic mythology of a hero's journey into hell, like Orpheus, you know, like it just felt like that. Even if I'm barely hanging on to the mythology of the book, 
I did really like this particular issue, although I'm fine if you didn't. That is the whole thing is that I think it was a good issue. Mm -hmm. I think it was well done. It worked well and as it was supposed to. But I was like, I don't remember anything that happened or what they're talking. And I, I don't think that's me. Mm -hmm. I just like, I think because I don't know who the characters are, I sometimes don't understand the nuances or the significance sure. of the things that happened in the other books that lead into the action here. And so the woman says, like, I have to fix something I did. And I was like, I don't know what she did because I don't really think that I understood. Like, she brought in this girl who was going to go and and I, she fooled her. She gave her powers like none of that. I wasn't connected to any of that. And again, I don't think that's me because to me, the storyline was this lady is in this secret society and she had to break up with her husband who's in sort of the other side of it. And then we're off to a sidetrack here out of nowhere. So I think the story worked on its own, but in the scope of the whole thing, I was like, we don't have much time and I don't know what this has to do with it. I don't know what's important. I don't even know. I don't know what the struggle is. If I offered you a billion dollars, could you tell me her name without looking? Jack. <sighs> I've the whole time I've been trying to come up with I'm it. I'm gonna need her the, full name for a billion. It dollars. is on the tip of the tongue. I know that there's a Cassandra, but that's not her. It's like Vesper. It's not like a, a normal name. It's like a James Bond name. She's like Japanese. That's so a Japanese name. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I don't remember. Eiko. Uh, Eiko. Yeah. Maki. I think everything you're saying is right. I think yes. this is the kind of book you need to read as a trade because yes. you don't have the emotional brain marker to know that Hawkeye has this history with Black Widow. And so when something happens, you recall the issue from when you were five and it makes sense and there's more resonance. These are all new characters. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in the world. Our brains are calcifying before our very ears and eyes. So it's hard to keep that up. However, I have enjoyed more issues of this than I haven't, which is kind of surprising considering. I don't mm -hmm. usually like this mumbo jumbo gobbledygooky stuff. In terms of the, you know, the magic-y, you know, I demon -y characters. But I've liked it. I did like this issue quite a bit. So I don't know. There's only two more to go. I can't say a lot's happened. It's made me really compelled to read more about these characters. So. Yeah. I don't know why anything's happening. Yes. But within the confines of this one story, it was very well done. It was a very good single issue. I understood yes. everything that was happening. I don't know the, the nuances of all the, the tribunal and the who other, you know. It didn't matter because it worked. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, I'm lost. It's funny about Thunderbolts is that every time it comes out, I think, am I reading this? Yes. And I think I read the first issue and then forgot to read anymore. I think that's what happened. I think I read the first couple issues of the last one, mm -hmm. but then stopped. And then this one, because that was the Jim Zub one. I think I maybe read all that. Thunderbolts are just this catch-all. Right. It's no longer what it was. It's now a way of branding the other heroes who aren't Avengers. Mm -hmm. Especially since there's a movie being shot right now, you know, called Thunderbolts. It's just sort of like the bad guy adventures. I guess that's the original concept, but yeah, it doesn't feel like that anymore. No, because originally it was villains who were pretending to be heroes so they could do villain shit, but then they became heroes and Hawkeye helped them along with that, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was a carny. Makes sense. Carney and then when we read trusted. like the Thunderbolts during the King in Black, they were all villains and they had to do some hero shit. Right. Which is compelling. The last one was more like, they hired Hawkeye to run a team of like people who'd won a contest, you know. Well, wasn't it? Well, it was, it was because it was during the whole thing where the heroes were supposedly outlawed, even though it wasn't the case in any other book. And so they were the only sanctioned heroes in New York. Right. But they were so all, it was like, all market like tested. PR. It was all PR stuff. Yeah. You know, and then this one is Bucky. You need to put a team together to do some shit. And then he realizes he's got to change the team out every time. There's not villains in this, except for the crime that is Black Widow being a fucking symbiote. <laughs> Oh, God. Which is worse than Mary when Jane. When did that happen and where and who can we blame? I mean, it, it clearly happened during the King and Black period. No, that was too long ago. When else would anybody get a symbiote infection? Because she hasn't been around. No, I'm going to look this up because there was a symbiote story that we both completely just ignored. Recently. Okay. Well, it was probably an aftermath of that thing. I don't know. I just hadn't seen her forever. And then when she shows up, she's got that. I just thought, you do not need this. You do not need this. It, it adds nothing. It's dumb. But... That's just because I don't like it. Sometimes when they do wacky shit in comics, I think it's great. I don't like mm. this one. And I recognize that that is completely subjective. It is completely up to the person. Yeah. Well, I think that knowing the character for a really long time, it just doesn't feel right. Sometimes they do a thing and it feels right. But it happened in the pages of Venom. Okay. Venom number 23. When was that? <laughs> like I know that. Venom number 23. This happened last year, mid last yeah. year, during some Venom story we totally ignored. Some Venom crossover. I like some of this. There's good doom in this. 
you know, but it's not quite, I don't know. I'm reading it. I read all of them. I like parts of it for sure. You know what? That also applies to New Burn 16, the final issue of New Burn. Really? Because I thought the last five of them had been the final issue. <laughs> Chip Zdarsky, Jacob Phillips, Pip Martin. <laughs> Pip Martin. <laughs> I really liked this book when it first started coming out. And mm-hmm. then at some point, about halfway through, I stopped really liking it. And But I kept reading it because it's not often you get these kind of just straight up crime books. And so I try to support them. And, you kept reading it because it felt like a criminal book. And I, I think in my mind, and I think you were doing it too, it was like, well, this is pretty much like criminal. And it keeps not being criminal, and it's disappointing for that reason. Well, I like everyone involved. Chip Zdarsky, obviously, yeah. I like. Jacob Phillips and Pip Martin, the team behind all the Chris Condon books that we enjoy. But this book didn't work for me. All said and done, didn't work. I never bonded with the character... Newburn, and as a result, the characters around him. I don't know what to make of him, and not in a mysterious way, but in a way that, like, after all this time, what's the point? I don't like him. Mm -hmm. I'm not impressed. I don't not like him. I don't know what to think. And then at the end, there was a bit like we wanted to do basically like something to do with like a TV detective. And I was like, well, that was not obvious. Well, in the beginning, it kind of was because it was episodic. Mm-hmm. It was more like a case of the week situation. It, there wasn't a big mythology, yeah. at least early on. So it was more like every issue was Newburn, who was a ex-cop who acted as the policeman of the underworld. So he would investigate and mediate any disputes between criminal organizations. And that's what the story was. And he would the first couple issues was sort of that as an episodic situation. Then they added in his new partner slash sort of mentee, who suddenly became really, really good at it from out of nowhere. <laughs> I guess she had gone to the police academy, but still... And then it became less episodic. That's when it got less interesting to me. It was when they added in the sort of mythology stuff. And then the mob was after her, because but they didn't know they were after her. I just got less interested. Because of her man. ex-boyfriend. Yeah. Like I think ultimately, I really didn't like what ended up being his origin story, his raison d'etre. The fact that he had to kill somebody and that was what. And I just, I don't know. It didn't, I'd rather have had him not explained, I think, just for some reason. Right. And then let her story be something. I don't know. It looked great. I appreciate the effort. intelligent. No, I think that's fair. Not everything works. And, you know, Zdarsky has a lot of different stuff going on. Some of it doesn't work. Some of it does. And the stuff that's, you know, interesting really works. Even the stuff that I don't like, I'm not like, that's a piece of shit. I mean, it, look, you can, it's pretty interesting that you can like a lot of stuff he does and you will still read something with his name on it, even though he's just thrashing your favorite character. <laughs> Beyond recognition. You know, the thing is with DC and Marvel, you never know how much of it's them and how much of it's the editorial edict, you know? Well. It's hard to say because those things are heavily editorial driven. Mm-hmm. I can't believe he walked in there and said, I'm going to fuck up Batman. They're like, cool. Who knows? I mean, usually it's got something to do with their, their concept. I mean, it goes around something. Tom didn't want to kill Alfred. He thought it was a hoax. But they said, no, he's going to die. You mm-hmm. know, that was editorially driven. Fair. Speaking of last issues, I started reading Alan Scott, The Green Lantern number five, thinking it was the last issue, but oh no, it was not. Only because every comic now seems to be five instead of six. So this, I thought, okay, this is it, but it was not. I want to just mention this because if there was a pick of the week for the moment of the week, it would be this oh. one. You have not read these No, still, no, right? no. I, this is one of the ones that I, like today, I did think, I was like, do I have time to catch up on this before we do the show? And I didn't, so... No. Well, you got one more issue to go. So, you so you're saying up. the next time I think of it, I have to read even more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's exponential. He's been fighting his ex-boyfriend who has this red flame power. It's worth noting that in this one, I don't know if this is the first time it's ever happened or it's happened before. I can't remember. They sort of shoehorn his power into the mythology of the Guardians so that it's not exactly from the power battery, but it's part of that sort of whole thing where... Sometime long ago, the Guardians collected all of the uh, sort of magic, the ancient magic, and put it into a star to hide it. But it, inside that star, it's sort of cooked <laughs> into the green flame, which somehow also draws upon the power of will. And it shot itself out of the, into the universe and be, ends up eventually finding Alan Scott. So they kind of sort of make him part of that tradition, but not exactly a Green Lantern of the Green Lantern Corps. That's fine. Whatever. But... He's fighting his ex-boyfriend. They're getting, then they start getting attacked by the Red Flame itself, and they're getting their asses handed to them. Plus, the Soviet super team shows up to beat up both of them, and they're losing badly. And the Red Flame is hurting Alan, and they're back against the wall. And Alan's like, "We need backup." And his, his ex says, well, "What about your friends?" And Alan says, "Friends, I don't, I don't have any 
And then we get the off-camera dialogue box saying, yes, you do. And you page turn to the whole fucking JSA standing there looking awesome. <laughs> I just was so happy. I, mean, I just want them to do an awesome JSA book. The one that's slowly but surely coming out is not working. And these miniseries they've been doing contextually to the time, the 30s and 40s, have been terrific. Give me one of those books. Let me continue on with this story where Alan Scott has to learn to become a member of the team because he fancies himself a, a loner and a rebel. Got it. Yes. I want to read that story. Tell that story with this team, the classic JSA team. But it was a terrific page turn, and I actually yelped when I turned the page. So this book has <laughs> been great. I'm looking forward to the final issue. Hey, that's it for this week's comics, the ones we wanted to talk about. But at patreon.com slash ifanboy, every patron gets a vote to add a book to the rundown. See, you get to be part of the show if you're a patron. And this week, the patrons overwhelmingly voted for Batman Dark Age Book 1 from Mark Russell, Michael, and Laura Allred, and Dave Sharp. And if you recall, Superman Space Age was one of our favorite books of whatever year that was that it came out. Was that two years ago? I think it was two years ago. What I do know is that if it hadn't been for the patrons, I think I might not have read this because I thought when I flipped onto it, I saw mm -hmm. like Mark Russell and Mike Allred, and I thought, yeah, I already read this. This must be the trade. Like it wasn't, you know what I mean? Like I had just forgot. I just thought I read something with them that was like this. And I just thought that this was the same thing. But no, it was a new series about Batman because in DC World, if you do something uh -huh. that works with Batman, then you have to do it for Superman and vice versa. Just have to. And why not? Hopefully this works and we'll get Wonder Woman. And this doesn't seem to be, I mean, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem to be same sequel world. in that it's part of that world. Although there's a bit at the end that brings it up to, it's hard to say. This is the first issue. I assume many people thought this was going to be the pick of the week. I liked it. I didn't love it. I'm not sure what to make of it. I think spending so much time with teenage Bruce wasn't super compelling. I liked cranky old man Bruce a lot. He was very funny. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to getting into the story of Batman. I just I don't think I just was incredibly involved in the story of young rebel Bruce Wayne. I wanted to get to the action. I think I enjoyed it, but I think that it took me time to get past the idea that I was like, I don't like this kid. And since right. I know where it's going, let's move along. Right. A little bit. But at the same time, what I really did respect about it, which isn't the same thing as enjoyed, but I was on the fence, mm -hmm. was that it really was a slightly different, at least a unique take on some extremely well-worn ground. It's much more unique than Ultimate Spider-Man is. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But I think that there was one thing in it that didn't make sense to me. Was it the long conversation with Lenny Bruce? That did make sense to me in the fact that I was like, this is weird. So like Batman's <laughs> sense of what he should be like is from Lenny Bruce. <laughs> I didn't say it was bad. I was just like, is this happening? This is like six pages of Lenny Bruce doing stand up and then talking to Bruce. I got to tell you, I don't know if these are actual Lenny Bruce routines, but if they were made up, they were an excellent simulacrum. <laughs> I really, because they're, they're like, Lenny Bruce doesn't like, there's not jokes like the punchlines are not what you expect and they and there's a turn in there that would happen in real life where he'd lose the audience anyway whatever did you notice the joker being in the stand i did notice suit? that yes okay. i did i absolutely did i ha i went back i like i kind of clocked it like oh, it's purple and green and then i was like oh it's a joke and he's mad and i was uh -huh. like all right so that's kind of interesting anyway it was not that it was the whole setup i thought was pretty intelligent it was very different than the initial you know the batman story is the bad guys are within wayne enterprises whatever and bruce wayne does what was kids will do is act out in sort of like sure. you're very privileged some shit has happened to him so he's acting out and the only thing that i didn't buy and i don't know what this alfred is supposed to be like mm -hmm. but like he's like oh alfred's gonna show up with donuts who cares and i was like no alfred's gonna no he did show up with donuts he's just <laughs> letting you he's enabling you to do all these things for some reason maybe it's because he feels bad for him or because right. he you know uh wants to give him the the rope but it felt like he was enabling him acting like an asshole and i didn't buy that i really 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 liked there was one redeeming bit of all that is that Batman is narrating himself in the past, mm -hmm. and he says, and I, I hated the words the moment they came out of my mouth, and then young Bruce Wayne says, you got an awful lot of opinions for the help, and I was like, oh, that's fucking terrible. Yeah, that's that like the worst thing you can say to Alfred. It's a knife in the heart. It was a wonderful I liked, I, mean, I like this. I just didn't love it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to see where it goes. I think the ending was the most interesting bit, so the whole and one of the whole subplots is that you know Bruce is going to inherit the company when he turns 18. He has the most stock, but until then, it's going to be 
held for him and they're going to put a temporary CEO in. And they, is it going to be Lucius? No, his department's the least lucrative and ends up being some off camera person, some tech genius that never bets wrong. Which is a ridiculously stupid idea that no one sees him. We can't see him. <laughs> yeah, he, he runs the company remotely. They were very ahead of their time in Wayne Enterprises. And then the last page reveal is that it's Pariah, the character who kicks off Crisis on Infinite Earths. And in this, in the Superman book, Pariah was the guy that Clark would, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, would, would talk to at the bar. Really? Who then led to that version of Crisis in that book. So, so he's doing something here as a recurring motif. And whether or not this is the same world or not, I found that interesting. So I did not expect the character to be Pariah. I didn't either. Yeah. And I read the last panel. Like, it won't matter. It only matters up to 1985. And I chortled. I was like, that's really funny. That's great. <laughs> they hand him a giant tome, which is the Wayne Enterprise's earning projections for the remainder of the century. And he says, oh, thanks. We didn't go that long term. We only need to go up to 1985. Yeah. And, and I, I just like, thought oh. that's really wonderful. That's a great sort of bit. So we'll see. I didn't think it was bad. I, and I, I think I loved Superman out of the gate, but I don't remember, honestly. By the end of it, it was one of my favorite things that I read that year. So hopes are high and expectations are high for this. Fairly or unfairly. I like the swing. Yeah. I definitely enjoyed it a lot more than didn't. I did not enjoy it. There's like parts where I was like, I don't know, but I'm compelled. Yeah. We'll see. I don't think business works like that, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, I don't know. Because this is basically the same plot as Billy Madison. Just. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Mr. Deeds. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, rate Batman Dark Age book one. Hmm. Ratings out of five, I'm going to go 3.75. I was right with you. That's the number in my head. It was good, but it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. But we'll see where it goes from here. Agree. Patreon.com slash iFanboy. Every patron gets a vote out of the book of the rundown. But the $5 or higher level, which is a vestige of the old system, but still, it counts. Any patron <laughs> who does that gets a superpower live on the show. We call it the patron power. And this week's patron power goes to Don Minak, who's almost a Minock. Chewing on the wires. Don Minak can animate statues. He can touch a statue and it comes to life. Is he in control or is the statue sentient? The statue is now sentient. He could turn it back to statue form. He can animate and unanimate statues. Okay. But so he's in control. Is it like a puppet master kind of thing? No, 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 not at all. The statue okay. is just now alive. Okay. All right. But in the grand tradition of Hollywood, the statue is sort of like a person, whoever, like if he animated my question. the David statue, he'd be like an Italian guy from the, what was it, whatever century it was that David was sculpted. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or if he'd animated the Statue of Liberty, it'd be a, a 1920s French woman. I want to say that's the 16th century. I want to say that for David. Yeah, I was thinking 14th or 1500s, but I couldn't remember exactly. 1500, yeah. I think. Let's see. So he can animate those statues. Now they could, you know, help him or they could be a problem. And if there's a problem, he can reanimate him right back. David was created from 1501 to 1504. Wow. It's right on there. Yeah, really. Yeah. So there you go, Don. That's amazing. Use your powers wisely. So like if he animated a statue of George Washington, you'd have George Washington walking around a statue for him. Can you ask them questions? I mean, it's them for their statue version. Like if you can animate like the giant Lincoln. Yeah. There's a lot you could ask him that would fill in the historical record. He'd ask you a lot of questions and then he would be like, put me back. Put sure, me back but in like, statue form. Would he this be is able terrible. to solve, like if you could animate, there's, there's too bad, there's no statues of Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh God. But like, you'd want to talk to him. Sure. Actually, he but... was kind of nuts. So who knows if you, you wouldn't. The thing is, a lot of people who know stuff, they never had statues made of them. <laughs> right, well, you can start hiring sculptors. Listen, this guy keeps hiring me. I made a Lee Harvey Oswald statue. I made a John Wilkes Booth statue. This guy's got problems. But he pays really well. <laughs> I don't want to do these Nazi statues. We have <laughs> questions. Don Minak, thanks for being a patron. Patreon.com slash iFanboy. Thank you for your support. Dan B. writes in. This is the audience question time. Dan B. He says, I read on an iPad, and it strikes me that when I flip the page and land on a double page spread, it has the exact opposite big impact the artist was likely going for because the image gets all scrunched down to fit the screen. Should artists take that into account and play to the fact that a single page image has a much bigger holy shit factor for us digital folk? Or am I just doing something wrong? I hold my iPad vertically because I like to see how the entire page is laid out and don't cotton to panel by panel guided view experience. Good use of cotton. So I've liked a lot of things about this email so far. I've been wondering why people give the precise amount of time they've been thinking of questions to start listening to your wonderful show about a year ago. 
to answer that would take too long. That's fair. Just go with it. Mm -hmm. It's our most successful, longest running joke. Yeah. And it makes us happy. Let's check the use of successful. (laughs) It's long running. It's successful because other people use it. Sure. And seem to enjoy it. There is an explanation. It's in one of the old shows. We cannot spend time talking about it, though. I do like that people are doing it now and they have no idea why they're doing it. <laughs> that <laughs> I really do. Like, that's, that's success. That's, that works. Like, I'll just take part in this. I, I want to say one thing before you get into it, because I know you feel Go very on. similar to Dan. No, the artist should not take that into account because digital is about 10% of the audience and you should not change the way you make comics to cater to 10% of the audience. Is that still the case? Yeah, it, it plateaued. and It's never changed, really. Okay. It was like 7 for a while, then it became 10. It sort of stuck at 10. So... Mm-hmm. If 90% of your audience is reading paper-wise, you shouldn't be catering to the digital reader. And I'm a digital reader and a happy one, but that's just the way it is. So I have this exact same even problem. Even if it was 20%, I, even if it doubled. It sure. No, I agree. I, I'm not, I have this exact same problem, and I really hate it. I do not like it when a digital comic goes double-page spread because not only do I have to sort of turn which blocks the flow of the thing, I tend to have to zoom in on those pages because the lettering gets a little smaller. And I don't like doing that. Where's your reading glasses? That's why I need them. That's the moment where I'm like, oh, crap. Actually, I have, and I have blue light reading glasses because I read at night and I don't want to get too tired. Then they find that that doesn't mean anything. We could get into it, but it doesn't mean anything for the most part. But if you are looking at a screen at night, it can reduce eye fatigue and let you, you know, not stay up as much. But that's about it. Anyway, that said, I also don't think that artists should change But that is because I'm kind of a formalist when it comes to comics. I'm not reading them in paper, but I want the historical record to show people using all of the tools available to them in the classic style of, you know, American mainstream comics. And that is one of them. And I hadn't even thought of the idea that, you know, 90% of people are reading them in that format. But just for the people who are, like, it, it is impactful. Like, not always. Like, it's not every time that they get it right, but... Some page turns on a double page spread. I think some people do overuse the double page spread. Bendis to me does it. I I feel like I don't think it's an awesome storytelling device. I think it's unless you're using it for an impact. Do you think for your problem, if you had one of those big iPads, it would mitigate it? Or you hate the turning of the iPad? I don't like the turning. And regardless, on a digital thing, it reads smaller. Instead of having an impact of being bigger, it actually becomes smaller. Yeah, it's like 75% the size of right. the regular page. So yeah. it doesn't work. The idea is that if you're doing it in a printed book, it overpowers. It's a double page spread, but like the size is much bigger. So there's an impact there, which just doesn't translate. Mm-hmm. And fair enough. You know, like that's my trade off for the convenience, I guess. So I agree. Like it sucks digitally. I've gotten used to it. I do notice like then when people are using it and they don't need to. Like, sometimes I wonder what the thought process is on it. I mean, the real problem is that Dan didn't tell us how long he'd been thinking about this question, so we shouldn't have even answered it. He did call it out. True. So I can't, you know, it's not like he ignored it, but we are missing some critical data. I'll just say, and I already know what you're going to say, and I can already feel your eye roll, but it doesn't bother me. Yeah, no, I can't make sense. I totally understand the impact of the loss because you're looking at a page 75%. My eyes are such that I still have really good close-up vision, so I don't have a problem reading the page. Mm-hmm. But... And I don't mind turning it. It's just that it does seem less so because it's not so big. But I don't really have a problem with it ultimately. But like, you know, certain books, this doesn't doesn't happen a lot, but certain like uh, printed books, like, you know, there's double page spreads in some of my favorite books and I wouldn't want to miss them. No. And when you'll, and if you're reading them in trade form, you'll see them in paper form. And so Mm -hmm. you get the the same impact that way. I think one of the, the, I was reading one of the Usagi Ojimbo's. Mm -hmm. recently it was one of the space ones and it was a double page spread and i was like i've never seen him do a double page spread it actually worked in that instance oddly enough i got the first volume from dark horses usagi ojimbo compendium and they're not the original ones it's from when he started at dark horse Uh but there was a double page spread right in the beginning of one of those i was like i was wrong he's been doing it (laughs) well you're not wrong dan a lot of people have feel the same way i think it's a common complaint amongst digital readers but it is what it is it's the trade-off though there's nothing you can really do you know you got to flip the ipad it's got to be you know what is this this is like i'm holding my fingers this is like a ma- yeah it's about no it's about two-thirds of the size of it yeah page it's not even 75 percent. i mean listen the double page spreads don't work in a lot of hardcovers either that's true it, which wait, is wait, almost is worse because you can't read it wait i screwed that up no it's 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 almost 75 percent of yeah it's just it just it just scrunches the page I do think about getting the bigger iPad sometimes, though, just to yeah. make the even bigger the pages. I'm telling you, the eye thing happens fast. 
Like it was My fast. family doesn't they certainly look like when they're all in their 70s and 80s, they all have reading glasses. Right. But my family's eyes tend to last. My I got bad far off vision, but that's not mm-hmm. because of genetics. It's because I fucked my eyes up when I was younger. They told you not to play with a knife. No one ever told me not to rub my eyes. Don't ever rub your eyes because it makes your corneas get weak and then you get eye problems. It's because you were watching TV so close, wasn't it? I had my nose right up to the screen. Right. That makes sense. I was like Frank Cross and Scrooge. Can I tell you something? You said that and I could hear what it's like to be near an old CRT TV. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that electrical. Sound? Well, because if you're old enough like us, TVs didn't have remote control, so you got to you had to sit within arm's length of the TV to change the well, channel. Well, that's you're no, you're, you're channel changing people. <laughs> that's not why. <laughs> well, unless it was a show like you were watching, like I'm not going to change the channel watching like Family Ties, but if it was like during the day, I, I you know, they don't have it anymore. But like the TV screen always had static on it. Like if you yeah. put your hand across it, you'd feel the oh, static. Oh, you feel it. That's yeah. yeah. Oh man. You just get, that was just, I had a little moment there. Fuck, we're old as shit. Not because we're talking about old shit, but because we're saying things. Remember this? And, and I had a black and white TV until well what? into elementary school. Same. And sort of, sort of my wife, we were just talking about that the other day. We were one of the last families in my friend group to get cable. Because I was talking about, yeah, us too. I was talking about something. I was like, and that was before cable. And I went, oh my God, that sounded like the <laughs> oldest thing ever. Like that was my movies used I to be. I remember TV Nick. signing off for the day. Yes. Yes. TV used to not go 24 hours. It would finish at a certain time, and they would play the national anthem, and then they would sign off for the day. I don't remember when it was, but I know that I woke up to static on multiple occasions in my right. childhood. And I remember being, for some reason, like, for whatever reason, I got to stay up late, and I was like, let's do this. And I was like, ready for TV, and I was like, it stops? I thought it would just keep going. According to Google, it was usually about 1 a.m. after, like, the late night shows was when TV would sign off for yeah, the day. Yeah, right. Like summer vacation, I would stay up late late enough for that. Yeah. And then infomercials happened. <laughs> right. Not nearly That's what would happen then. We really took a tangent on your question, Dan. Let's do a quick one from Ben H. We can answer this one pretty fast. Ben says, I'm probably not the first to suggest it, but with the recent passing of Akira Toriyama, I wondered if you'd consider a book split on either Dragon Ball or his other major comics work, Dr. Slump. And Ben, you are the first would we consider I think we consider anything, but probably not. The reason why I say that is because first of all, we just had a whole old man conversation about TV, so this is gonna give you a clue. Josh and I didn't grow up reading manga or watching anime. That was for people about five or ten years younger than us. So it's just not part of our nostalgic feeling. I don't think you'd want us doing it. Honestly, I don't know what the fuck up Dragon Ball is. And quite frankly, I'm not all that curious. I can speak to it with a little more. And I, I think that is true to a certain extent. But I have seen enough Dragon Ball and a lot of... Oh, you have? How did you see Dragon Ball? I don't know. There was a period of time where I, I don't know, it was on Cartoon Network. Like I caught a little bit of it and I kind of understood it. My son watches a lot of anime mm. and I don't like any of it. Mm. You know, like he went through Avatar. He's watching One Piece now. I liked Avatar. I did. Yeah. But that wasn't anime. That was made in America. Yeah, well, right. Anime is produced in Japan. But a lot of the stuff, I've seen like a little bit of Dragon Ball and it's it's just like a lot of that like, I've seen, I mean, I've seen Akira. I've, you know, I've watched, I just, it doesn't do a lot for me. I'm not interested in it at all. So like to say like, I've been around it enough to be sort of familiar with what it's kind of like and it doesn't interest me that much. And- it's just not in our storytelling wheelhouse like we've, yeah. we've certainly read manga we've reviewed it i've read manga i've really enjoyed it's all great storytelling it's just not a part of what we grew up doing so it doesn't tug at us i feel like when akira toriyama died lots of people were really sad about it and people who i'm friends with were but they're all like 10 years younger than me and i just mm-hmm. don't it's just not my thing like x-men 97 right i just didn't grow up with it it's like power rangers when ryan comes on and talks about it like he's however many years younger than us and that was his wheelhouse it's just also like everything that I've seen, it just feels really out of my aesthetic. That's what I mean, because we didn't grow yeah. up with it. We didn't grow up with that aesthetic, so it's not part of our thing. What's interesting to me, though, is that, like I said, Oliver's watching One Piece. And I guess there's like 30 seasons. This is a fuck ton of episodes. And I thought, it is so fascinating that, you know, my son, who, you know, he's a nerd. And I mean that in the sense that, like, you know, we're all nerds. You mean that in the sense that you're a guy talking on a comic podcast. Exactly. But, like, you know, and he's not going to be the same type of nerd. But I think it is fascinating that, like, a nerd will gravitate towards nerdy-ass shit. Mm -hmm. And, like, that was the thing he found, like, so many other nerds before him. Like, whoa, this weird-ass Japanese show. 
And mm-hmm. when I walk by, I'm like, this is fucking irritating. It's annoying sounding. And I don't, I'm not like, this is bad. You shouldn't watch it. It's, just, it's not my thing. But I think it is amazing that he found his way to anime. I had nothing to do with that. It's just okay. like, it speaks to people. That's like, I think for like you and I, maybe me, I don't know so much about you, but like some kids found their way to anime. I found my way to British sitcoms. Like oh. that was my nerd shit. Right. Everyone likes different stuff. And there wasn't as much of it when we were kids. It just, it's a, there's also a little bit of younger brother syndrome where it's like, mm-hmm. that's the annoying younger brothers liked. It was also super hard to get. Like you'd well, have yeah, to buy like, when we were yeah. kids, you'd have to like buy bootlegs at comic conventions or something. Right. And the only one really I remember people watching as a kid was Akira. Mm-hmm. And that was also still hard to get. And I think, I think I may have watched it. I don't remember anything. I watched but, it. Well, the point is this. Times. I'm sure it's good. And I'm sure if I watched like, this is the best one. Mm-hmm. I might even like it, but I hear the word Dragon Ball Z and I wince. And it's just only because I was in high school or whatever. I really don't think you'd like it, though. Right. That's what I mean. Like, I just, it just tied into the age I was when it happened, you know? And there's nothing against it or the people who like it. It's just that that's just what it is, Mm -hmm. you know? Like Naruto. Naruto. I'll ever watch that. (laughs) What are you going to do? So, unlikely, unlikely. But, I'm willing to be convinced, but I don't think it would go well. I just don't think it go I don't think you want to hear it not go well, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't think I want to get those emails. Yeah. I don't think I'm doing justice to the work. Right. That's what I mean. It's just not a thing. I don't think, like I said earlier, you don't want us to do it. Mm. You know? I don't want Unless you're into the torture thing. Right. It's like, it's like saying, would you guys do a thing on Power Rangers? Like, we've done that joke before, and I don't want to do it again. It's not very valuable for anybody. Right. Right. We like to do when Ryan's on the show to poke at him, but that I don't want to, like, in, in general, I don't want to spend half an hour on something I don't connect with. Mm-hmm. Thanks for writing in, Ben. And Dan, contact at ifanboy.com is our email address. You can also write in for our Media Splode show. Put Media Splode in the subject line if you do. Thanks for writing in. We've been getting terrific emails all this year. Keep it up. Good job, it's everybody. True. It's actually it's a good point. So two weeks ago, there was Media Splode. We talked about the Academy Awards. Well, Connor and Ron talked about the Academy Awards, and I... I probably looked up something about ancient maritime history <laughs> while that was happening. And then so we you are, are a different kind of nerd. Oh, totally. No, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, I read history books constantly. Then uh, we did the What should We Should Watch next challenge where uh, we, from our list of things we were planning to watch, and at some point, the other two guys set down a rule. Shows for read. them. You have to watch the show. Did you show. watch yours yet? Two episodes, I watched one of the two episodes that I had to watch. And What was your show again? Oh, yours was The Gentleman. The Gentleman. Right. So that'll happen the next time there's a media explode. Week after that, last week, they put out Talksplode with Rob Williams of a very much 2000 AD and Judge Dredd, a bunch of Marvel and DC comics and some really great creator-owned miniseries. Right now, he's doing Petrohead, which uh, Connor and I have been so uh, just over the over the moon about with Pi Par. Yeah. And I thought it was just a really great conversation with a thoughtful working writer. Hmm. And he's like, I can't imagine anyone. I was like, dude, I'm interested. So don't worry about it. (laughs) All good. Then this past week, we are special editioning it up around here. The book explode just came out where Connor and I talked about Homicide, the graphic novel, part one and pretty much part two by Philippe Scorsoni, the adaptation, comic book adaptation of David Simon's uh, wonderful nonfiction book from 1990. Uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember i know it's not I 91 wanna, the book the yeah. book came out in 91 the show premiered the next year yeah i want to say 89 for some reason i know well, the book the takes place in the late 80s that's probably it and then he, it came out in 1991 and then the show came out a year later you'll have to get into that book's blow to sort of get all the details about it we get in there we good conversation about that book in april you have a talk explode coming up well, actually, I already kind of booked that, now that I think about it. Yes, it is. A media explode. We'll be talking about Dune Part 2, and uh, we'll follow up on the challenge. Right. So we all watched Dune Part 2. We're going to review that. That's going to be interesting. Animation Brain Trust reconvenes. It feels like it's been a while. Uh, yes. Crisis on Infinite Earths Part 2. It's part. It's a three-part movie series. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, good. That's the, 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 that, that does it justice. Gives it time to breathe. Mm-hmm. So that's all happening. Check those out. We do a lot of special shows. And then after that, who knows? I don't even know when the movie started again. It was Deadpool this year anyway. You can find our library over 1,300 shows at 1,400 or 1,300. I don't remember which. It's close to 14. I don't know. I've never counted. Over at ifanboy.com and wherever podcasts are sold. You can follow us at Ifanboy Comics on Instagram to find out what the pick of the week is before the show comes out. Or sometimes the best of the week in panels. It's already happening this week as we record. I've already posted some. Individually, we are C.S. Kilpatrick and J.A. Flanagan on Instagram. Thank you.
Give us a follow. We're not very exciting, but you never know. Sell it. Come on. <laughs> Put a little more into it. It's not that exciting. It's true. But it could be. I don't want to write checks that we can't cash. No, no. I'm saying you never know. Maybe one day, one, you know, Josh gets super drunk and start ranting about the government on it. He'll do it live. I guess it's technically possible. <laughs> it's technically possible. Uh-huh. I had a hard cider for the first time in, like, years. Yes, wow. yeah, yeah, yesterday. Rough day. I was just in there for a really long time, and I was like, I don't like throwing things away, so I was like, I guess I'll just drink it. <laughs> See? It, it had it gone another way. Josh could have gone on, open up Instagram, press the live button, and then you, who knows what would have happened. <laughs> the old twit pick my balls conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> that was the... <laughs> that was back in the days before social media really took off because there was twit pick. That was the sign of somebody losing it. Like, fuck right. it. I'm going to twit pick my balls. I'm just going to finish this. <laughs> Subscribe to youtube.com slash ifanboy. You'll find it all over our old video shows. You'll see us several decades younger talking about comics in much the same way but thinner and wearing shorts we also post this show there every week too if you want to listen there on youtube there it is please consider live reading no reading fuck reading writing a review or leaving a star rating on apple Podcasts, spotify wherever you get your podcasts i sound drunk i'm just really hungry thanks for listening i had fun coming back i missed you and the show and the listeners so thanks for having me back back that up Back that up with some appearances. I'm not going to be on the show next week. You son of a bitch. It's not my fault. I want to be on the show. I know. Everything's happening the same three-week span. I'm sorry. Yeah. I miss you guys. It's not like I'm going to get to take time off when you get back. You could. I got nowhere to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. My name is Connor. I have no plans after that until like July. So I should All be right. on the show from April through July. We might take the kids somewhere for their April vacation. I don't know. Fewer work trips this year. That's what I'm hoping. We're bad at planning. My name is Connor. I'm Josh. Bye.